Hello and welcome to As Time Goes By. I'm Rich O'Brien. Uh, some would think of it as quaint, perhaps. I've heard that phrase used. Others have said it's uh, a cultural center. Whatever you think of it, we're going to take a look at it and its history, at least the first part of its history, when we take a look at Lawrence and the history of Lawrence when we come back. Welcome back. We're going to take a look at the history of Lawrence today, and uh, who better to have in here than Steve Jansen, who is uh, the director of Watkins Museum. Steve, glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, I want to take a look, first of all, at what happened just before Lawrence could be considered founded. Right. What, what led up to it? Well, of course, Kansas is named after Kansas, the, the Indians that came here in the 16th century seeking to flee from the diseases that had begun to affect the Native American populations, and Kansas means people of the south wind, and I think that's self-explanatory given our prevailing wind direction. And uh, this valley was carved out by the Wisconsin Glacier, which is one of the last glaciers to go this far south, and it carved out Mount Orient and Blue Mound and the area around uh, the, on the banks of the Kaw where Lawrence later develops. And so this area was a tall grass prairie. We get 34 to 36 inches of rain here, unlike the Flint Hills. And thanks to William Least Heat Moon and Chase County, there's a lot of attention to the short and medium range glass of the Chase County variety. But here we got 34 to 36 inches of rain. So the grass tall here, grass, huh? six to nine feet tall grass. Yeah, yeah. And they'd have to stand up in the stirrups of their saddle to be able to see over the tall grass. And oh, it was a a tremendously rich valley. They said it was the most fertile valley between here and the Willamette in the Oregon when the early travelers went through on the Oregon trails. And of course it was the trails that first attracted people into the area. The land had been, after the Kansas had been moved to Council Grove, the land had been given to the Shawnees, the Wyandots, the Sac and Fox, the Keokuk, the Eastern Indian tribes that were moved here by Indian removal after 1830. And they were given the land, of course, for as long as the grass shall grow and the river shall run, which meant 24 years. Uh, and then eventually uh, Stephen Douglas... For you mean whom, it turned out to be 24 Well, years. yes. Yeah. Uh, our, our history of treaty making with the Native Americans rivals... Well, yeah. yeah, it's not one of our better chapters. Before you go on, it's interesting, I have just a question about this. It's interesting you mentioned the glacier because actually uh, the, the lay of the land in the Lawrence right. area is different than anywhere around it. Well, we well, like that, of course, about yeah. our community. And it, I think it's it is the Wisconsin Glacier yeah. that has the immediate impact uh, that, that creates this. And it goes to about the middle of Douglas County. And so by the time you get to uh, going up on 59, up into the high lands of southern Douglas County, you're into more of a, a common Kansas uh, variety of landscape. But down here in the River Valley, you're talking about mm -hmm. something that's shaped by the Wisconsin Quite Glacier. Quite beautiful and hilly. It's, it's really nice. Right. In fact, that, that was part of what attracted the first settlers who came through here. Charles Robinson in 1849 came through here as an, on his way to California for the gold fields. And he said, nature made this for a city. And he rolled out on a hmm. hill watching the flocks that he was tending, grazing, and he spoke about the beauty of the area and how uh, I think it reminded a lot of them of the Ohio River Valley and the New England River Valleys that they'd come from. So it attracted a lot of attention. But in terms of, by the time you get to Manhattan, and I don't know for sure about Topeka, but the rainfall drops off. By, in Manhattan, they get six to eight inches less rain than we do a year. So it does support a different kind of a environment, a different kind of flora and fauna in this area. So we're sort of on now, the... Is that caused by the lay of the land? Well, and the, and the, river and the prevailing pretty... wind patterns. I yeah. mean, we, um, we do get those 34 to 36 inches of rain, so that supports the six to nine foot tall grass. And literally, by the time you get to Manhattan and Topeka and Shawnee County, you're into more of a stockman grazing kind of agriculture, where here you mm -hmm. could support corn belt. I mean, uh, going towards Eudora, you see more of a traditional corn belt yeah. agriculture. So we're right on the on a transition zone here in Lawrence and Douglas County. Wow. But the uh, Oregon-California trails were 
were stimulants, as was the Santa Fe. Johnson County and Douglas County are the only two counties in the state where both the Santa Fe and the Oregon California trails ran. So we were, just as we are now with the interstate, we were very much of a transit point early on. Mm -hmm. And so people, uh, the early exploring parties were sent through here and they were sent through in late July. And that led them to call this the Great American Desert and anybody who's lived here in late July and early August can perhaps understand. So they were really going somewhere else, weren't they? Right. I mean, even the ones who stopped here and finally founded this place, were they really on the way to west? No, the New Englanders, they, 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 meant, to come they meant to come here because Charles Robinson had been here five years before. Okay, on so he'd given them the picture of what Right, was. and, and he, he, I think, picked out this spot as them to, to come to. But when they went through this area in the early days, be, even though there were, that's the thing I think that's so hard for us, there were very few trees. You know, mm -hmm. and those of us that live in eastern Kansas, we get a little smug when we drive through central and western Kansas, and we think, oh boy, a little sparse out here. We forget our own history because we were every bit as sparse and lacking in trees as they were. The prairie fires lasting until 1866 made it very difficult for trees to grow in this environment. As late as 1883, in a survey of Douglas County, they said it was 94% open prairie and only 6% trees. And all you have to do is look around to see how much that has changed. So. They overcame this great American desert idea, ironically, because the Shawnees, the Wyandots, the Sac and Fox, the Keokuks had been significantly intermarried by white European style uh, folks who practiced European style agriculture. And so as you went west to get to Oregon and California, you had to leave Westport in late April, early May. So they went through this when it looked like a garden spot instead of a desert spot. So that helped to revise the image of this area and led to Stephen Douglas when he's looking to organize the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And they were also looking for a transcontinental railroad route by the early 1850s. And so Kansas, as does Nebraska, becomes critical to the placement of a transcontinental railroad. It really route. is a gateway. Very much. Yeah, historically speaking. Very much. And there is a book by Louise Berry called The Gateway to the American West that traces from 1540 into the 19th century the hundreds and hundreds of parties that went through our area. I think it's interesting how as history has, has moved on, as time has moved on, that in those early days it was seen by the rest of the people in the country as the West. Oh, definitely. Whereas now it's, it's you know, the West is considered considerably farther, further away. Right, right. Yeah, we're more Eastern oriented now, aren't we? Or at least Midwestern oriented. Well, and I think in this day and age, too, of where our culture comes from, generated by national media centers, we've lost a lot of our dialects, our regional variations of oh, eating yeah. habits and customs. So we're becoming more homogenized and more created by a culture external than a culture local. Yeah, rather sad in a way. Well, it's definitely different, I believe, as a historian, the change is going to happen. The issue is whether you can understand it and be flexible enough to not try and stop change, but rather adapt to it, preserving hopefully the important qualities of life and, and character. So who put down the first uh, stake and said, this is Lawrence? Well, they sent out, because Stephen Douglas was coming here, we've got to remember Missouri had been a slave state since 1820. Mm -hmm. So in the minds of the Missourians, Nebraska was to go to the north and Kansas was to have been theirs. Now they repealed the Compromise of 1850 under which both a slave state and a free state came in, but that was still part of the uh, operating the expectation thinking, yeah. of the people. And so they assumed that was going to happen. And uh, it didn't. And specifically Eli Thayer who ran a boarding school in Worcester, Massachusetts called the Oread Academy. Wow. So there's your name for the University Hill. There you go. And Amos Lawrence was an early treasurer of the Massachusetts Immigrant Aid Society. And so they were looking for a location in Kansas. And they first party left Boston in mid-July with much fanfare. John Greenleaf Whittier, a New England poet, wrote the Kansas immigrants, sung to the tune of Odd, Odd Lang Syne, which we're coming up on soon at New Year's Eve. And they left in great fanfare and 29 men arrived on July 30th of 1854. And they said that the wind resembled the blast of a furnace. So some things haven't changed. <laughs> uh, except I think now with air conditioning, we've even more made the furnace even hotter because we artificially cool ourselves. But then the second party came in September and the boulder that's between the two bridges on the south side of the river represents then the names of the first and second party that formed the town association. And they originally had called this area Wakarusha. They found out that meant hip deep in muddy water and they decided that wasn't a good term. Is that true? Yes. And so they chose Amos Lawrence 
uh, because Lawrence didn't have any, uh, as they said, Robinson said to him, it had no odious attachment to it, and it was a pleasant sounding name, and they wanted to recognize the man who was really financing the Massachusetts Immigrant Aid Company. So we consider ourselves to be the symbolic birthplace of the Civil War because it was here that the North and the South first started fighting in a new level. We were the Salma, Alabama, the Little Rock, Arkansas of the 1850s because it was here that the New Englanders developed a free state outpost in a free state fortress. The first elections started first in November of 1854 and then March of 1855 resulted in pro-slavery majorities partially because of fraudulent elections. The problem was when you went to a ballot box in those days, you literally had a colored ballot. We today have what we call an Australian ballot. Very simple, very sparse, no sign of what you're voting for. But sure. in those days, you could tell whether someone was voting free state or pro-slavery. Now, David Rice Atchison had said, if the Yankees can afford to send their scallywags and hirelings thousands of miles, to defend their institutions, then surely you can afford to ride a few hundred miles. And so that's why we consider this to be the symbolic birthplace, because the New Englanders coming into what the Missourians thought was going to be their territory engendered this mm -hmm. confrontation. Pretty mildly put, it was intimidation, wasn't it? Election by intimidation. Well, there's no clear residency requirement. See, yeah, the New Englanders would show up the night before an election and expect to be able to vote the next day, too. So it's not all on one side of the uh, ledger. So there's, there's just, you know, I, I, I equate it to what we see happening in third world countries today. Americans tend to see situations and say, well, why don't they settle down and vote? And even if 50% of them don't vote like we do today, at least they'd handle it through the electoral process. But what we see in territorial Kansas is a classic example of what happens when that electoral process fails. And then you have a resort to arms in a resort to force, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what happens here. Mm -hmm. So the, the city uh, got underway with just really a handful of people, as right. you would expect in those days. Uh, what kept it going? Obviously, um, it had a lot uh, against it, too. It did. It was very much a besieged community for a period of time, and it was it, the Missourians wouldn't trade with it. And they sent uh, money and supplies through various kind of uh, means of, of through the steamboats up the river, and they uh, they sent a lot of, the New England Immigrant Aid Company was set out to be a land stock company, but in fact it became a philanthropic exercise of Amos Lawrence. And he sent a lot of, I mean literally the first couple of years, and when Horace Greeley comes through here, he says, these people don't farm, they don't work the land, they don't do what they're supposed to do, all they do is talk about war. So it was a very chaotic yeah. situation here. What is a land a stock company? Clear that up for me. I'm a little... uh, well, okay, it's very unusual. Most settlements in the United States happen by families moving out, sometimes extended families, sometimes associated with religion. But what happened here was the Massachusetts Immigrant Aid Company, which later becomes the New England Immigrant Aid Company, founds a land stock company and they literally sell stock. They build a hotel at 7th and Massachusetts and they intended to sell land. Now it never really worked on a profit making basis, but they did attempt to go throughout New England using clergymen and libraries and lyceums to raise money from New Englanders to send immigrant parties. And those immigrant parties come first to Lawrence, then to Topeka, then to Emporia, then to Manhattan. So a number of our communities in eastern Kansas have their roots in these immigration parties of the immigrant aid com companies. So settled by these various groups that have just come over. Right. Apparently. And, well, they, they're New Englanders. They're Yankees in the sense that they're third generation. They're not, okay, they're um, not immediate immigrants. No, they're not immediate mm -hmm. immigrants. And in fact, they're very, uh, uh, a very young group, very idealistic, very much wanting to become involved. Now, they're not abolitionists. And this is important because a lot of people say Lawrence is founded by abolitionists. They're founded, by, they're founded by free soilers. Now, free soilers didn't particularly identify morally or humanitarianly with the plight of the black man and woman. Unfortunately, well, it was just the nature of the times, they saw slavery as an economic question. Because if you bought a male slave or a female slave, you had to pay thousands of dollars. Well, that meant it much was a fight much like corporate farming versus family farming. And the New Englanders and the people of the North thought it was an unfair competition because even the average slave owner in Missouri who had less than 10 slaves, that's still, if you take 1000 to $1,500 per slave, that's still a heck of a lot more capital than what the yeoman farmer from the North had. Mm -hmm. So that was an escalating of the struggle. And the Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln, which is founded in Bleeding Kansas's national furor, that all grows out of this issue of slavery in the West, 
Now, the New Englanders, Amos Lawrence, their solution to the race problem was to send blacks back to Liberia. No kidding. They're not abolitionists. They are not morally, uh, they rather see it as a struggle, a conspiracy as, as events become more and more violent. People tend to stereotype each other. So that's what happened here. And they saw this as a struggle between the slave power conspiracy who was attempting mm. to take over the West. And so they, they attempt to stop that. And Kansas happens to be the first territory that came open as this struggle between the North and the South Where becomes more and more. Where they didn't have to more, deal with the issue right. in, in a direct sense. And they no longer are initially, see the idea before was it was held in the halls of Congress. Yeah. But here you say the people in the territories themselves will decide whether it's slave or free. A nice yeah. theory. It seems like local self-control, but no clear residency requirements. We're going to take a break. Right. Give you a chance to take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll come back in a minute with more on the history of Lawrence. Stay tuned. Welcome back to As Time Goes By. We're talking about the history of Lawrence. And uh, whether you're a native uh, of Lawrence or not, I, I find it extremely interesting to know about the community in which one lives. Don't you, Steve? Definitely. And, and we've got so many children and people moving into our community that want to plug into our history. Yeah, and I want to say before we go on that uh, we're, we're going to break this down into several programs, if you're willing. Oh, well, I'm more than willing. And very uh, So that you don't feel rushed. And we want to just sort of move along, come to the end of this program, and we'll come back on another time and go to the next part. That's great. How's that? That's great. All right, so we, we're, we've got it settled. That is, we've got a right. few settlers in here. The year is now what? Well, let's say uh, Lawrence is first attacked in 1856, and the, the hotel is sacked in 1856. And then after that first sack, Lawrence grows to about That's a thousand. That's the Eldridge. Okay. The, the Eldridge Hotel, okay. right, at 7th and Massachusetts. And um, this was part of when we became such a national event, Bleeding Kansas. Then. Uh, eventually the pro-slavery government is pushed out and the Free State Party comes into power and they start meeting in Lawrence. But Kansas doesn't come into the Union until January 29th, 1861 because of the controversy back in the South about whether Kansas should be slave or free. We literally don't come into the Union until after the South has succeeded. Now by the South, at this time we're talking about Montgomery, we're talking about Richmond, we're talking about the headquarters of the Confederacy? Well, they or? physically, this is pre-Confederacy. Oh, that's this right, it is, is, isn't it? That's 60, right, okay. January 29, 1861, yeah. but it literally takes the on, uh, onset of the Civil War for Kansas to be admitted into the Union. Hmm. Lawrence was the unofficial territorial capital of the Free State Party. When they have a vote, actually, it goes to Topeka, partly because Lawrence was seen as such a partisan site. Well, then, in 1863, the Jayhawkers, led by Jim Lane, and Jayhawkers meant not a blue bird, but people from eastern <laughs> Kansas who were against slavery. And was they it just a made up name? Uh, well, it's a great story. <laughs> and, uh, supposedly it's a term, it's one of Kansas's most unusual words, but it went, meant supposedly a bird that lived off the forage and off the ground, but in fact no bird of that character was ever found. Sort of a derisive term at the time. Oh yeah, I mean uh, if you uh, could imagine in Missouri today, if you have much of a sense of history, I'm not so sure they welcome the term Jayhawk yet in that state because Jayhawkers raided Clay, Platt, and Jackson counties in, led by people from Lawrence. And so Jayhawkers <laughs> with an ER in the end of it is a very derisive term and it still is in certain sectors in Missouri. Okay. And so eventually this culminates in 1863 when 400 men ride three nights, 45 miles to the Kansas State Line, Missouri-Kansas State Line, and then 45 miles to Lawrence. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, they attack Lawrence, a town of about 2,000, 2,500 people, about five to six blocks east-west and north-south. And they come down into the, the Massachusetts Street and they stop at the Oldridge Hotel expecting resistance and in fact the hotel had been built with a military purpose in mind but when no resistance is encountered the people surrender and then the men break up into eight or nine different parties and go throughout Lawrence and in the space of four hours on a Friday morning August 21st 1863 
we now know at least 188, probably more, men were killed. Oh. And that's then one of the scenes of one of the most brutal events of the Civil War. Now, compared to Gettysburg and the attack on Atlanta, the numbers don't compare. But in terms of the West, we have been declared by the Civil War Roundtable to be the scene of the most important event of the Civil War west of the Mississippi because of Quantrill's raid. Then eventually after that, the, the Missourians are pushed Clay Platte and Jackson counties are virtually depopulated. And this just adds, this is like maybe the eighth or ninth time of violence and cycles of violence and revenge and reprisals that had happened here going back to pre-Civil War days. But eventually when the North wins, then Kansas is, is very much happy. They're very saddened by the assassination of Lincoln and they get very mad at a Lawrence senator named Edmund G. Ross who votes against the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, the man who John Kennedy says saved the Constitution, was a newspaper editor in Lawrence, Kansas. And so he, and then, but at, on the heels of that, Ross had been sent here after the raid to protect the town. And of course, we now associate the University Hill with being the center of our community. But they were very afraid of that hill because that's where they thought attack could be mounted on. Sure. Oh, and then after the war, they, after a few well-placed uh, financial inducements with state legislators, they decide in 1864 and 1865 to place the state university in Lawrence, Kansas. And on September 14th, 1866, 54 students and three teachers come to the one building, North College, at approximately the site of Corbin Hall or 11th in Louisiana. And Lawrence's second chapter starts as the Athens of the West. The Athens of the West. Yes. The Athens of Kansas or the Athens of the West. That's where we get this cultural center concept. Right. Uh, and then us. Haskell comes along in 1884 and uh, Lawrence develops a great reputation as an educational center. But there was uh, some heritages. The black community of Lawrence came from the contrabands who freed themselves and came into Lawrence. And so Lawrence in 1870 has a 20 to 25 percent black population. Today we have 4.4. So it's a much different community. Germans make up about 20 percent of the population by 1870. So it would be a much more ethnically different Lawrence than the one we know today. I don't think people realize that. I certainly didn't, uh, that it, it had changed so drastically from... Well, and percentage-wise, black population reaches a height of 2,200 in 1885, and it's physically another 100 years before black population reaches 2,000 again. So there's an out-migration of blacks in Lawrence, but Lawrence is a tremendous center of black ferment. Uh, George Nash Walker, the first breakthrough black entertainer, who with his partner Burt Williams were the first blacks to appear on American stage, come from here. And so there's other people, there's a whole black religion that's founded in Lawrence in 1896. So it's a very vibrant community that develops here in Lawrence. And there are, and the beauty of Lawrence is, and it's still true today, we didn't develop a traditional one part of town associated with the black population. We have multiple sites where blacks have lived and interacted with whites. So there's an integration that occurs. You know, I'm thinking, and of course we have to wrap it up so we can do the right. rest of it later, but I'm thinking that uh, there's so much history that twists and turns on this community. And if not this community, certainly Kansas. Right. Uh, I mean, with the, with the Brown versus Board in Topeka, which is certainly near here, uh, and all of these things taking place in this area. It's amazing, and I think there are things that people just don't understand or know about this history. Thank you so much. We'd stop here. Well, thank you. But uh, we're going to come back. You said you would. I would. I'd be glad to. We'll hold you, hold you to it. Thank <laughs> you for your kind patience. Steve Jansen from the uh, Watkins Museum, thank you for sharing with us, and don't go anywhere until you've come back and done this, okay? That's fine. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll be back with more next time on As Time Goes By. Order your copy by calling 841-2100.